When I say we are, you say Westlake. We are. We are. We are. And show me you're ready. Wow, the audience I have here in the multi-purpose room, you look amazing. I obviously can't see all the other audiences around our school or around our community, but I'm assuming you look just as amazing. This is a first, everybody. This is the first Mustang Musings Assembly ever that is being broadcast um, and streamed live. So it's a bit of an experiment. We do have two different classes in the multi-purpose room. They're all spaced socially distant. Um, we also have classes around the Westbrook campus. They're all watching the same thing as long as they're troubleshooting their technical difficulties, which have been, of course, um, always a challenge to start the year and exceptional given our circumstances. Hopefully many people at home are able to be watching and accessing. I can see we've got an audience already. We're going to do the best we can in a format that we haven't done this before. So bear with us. Um, we really want to see how well we can get this to be a standard practice so that you and everyone else can be very used to it. And uh, we got a lot to cover. When we go through our Mustang Musings assemblies, these are opportunities for us to be able to get to coordinate a little bit as a team, to touch bases, and to make sure that we're all on the same page so we don't get a ton of opportunities. Don't get a ton of opportunities to do this. And we want to take advantage of them when we do. Now, many of you are returning to Westlake. Some of you are brand new to Westlake. Obviously, all of our seventh graders are brand new to, our, to Westlake and even some of our eighth graders. Um, that's one of the reasons we like to kind of do these assemblies. It gives us a chance to open up the playbook and, and make sure that, that we all understand the plays and are on the same team. One of the things I want to start with is actually a video clip that's one minute long that is something that was put together by our um, student body officers a couple years ago, but it sets the stage for a lot of what we're gonna talk about today. Now, to do this, I know that the audio is not great when I'm speaking. It's even worse, unfortunately, when I have to play a video and you can hear it. You just gotta listen pretty well. Um, when we publish this later, we'll, we'll do the real video overlay, but for the live broadcast, that's pretty difficult to do. So listen well, and I'm gonna plug this in and then we'll talk about it right after. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round kings of the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fun, and they have no respect for the steps of one. Either call them as them, glorify or vilify them. But the only thing you can do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see humans. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Like I said, I know that we don't have a perfect um, audio transmission. We're gonna get better and better at this. Um, we could hear it really well in the multi-purpose room. For those who couldn't hear it really well outside of this room, um, that is something that's kind of been a foundational conversation point for us at Westlake. Now, if you've heard that before, it's because it's on the Apple commercial or an Apple commercial that aired a long time ago. If you don't know Apple, Apple's the one who makes your iPhone or your AirPods. Um, and we feel like as a STEM school, there's a lot about Apple that we relate to. There was a company and many companies like them that, that innovate, they think differently. They wanna try something that maybe has never been tried before. We go to a STEM school. That doesn't mean we just learn about science and math. It means we think like scientists and mathematicians and engineers. Um, that transcends a lot of our subjects. I watch in our band and our orchestra, how much they have that mindset of experimenting, trying it, did it work, did it not work? And to keep tweaking it. Um, world language does the same kind of thing. You can't learn it by not practicing it you got to do it you got to fail a little bit and when you do that you start to really push boundaries and create things so we've adopted that as a school it might seem silly but crazy um we took it right from that same commercial we thought for 
And we started to talk about it in terms of a mnemonic device or an acronym. Every letter stands for something else that really represents us and what we're shooting for. So you see it on my screen. I know it's not the best transmission. I'm gonna um, center it just a little better. The C, raise your hand if you were here last year. Okay, the count of three. I want everybody who was here last year to shout it out. One, two, three. Curious. They, they really shout it out loud. Curious. When we say crazy, when we say the C, we're talking about being curious. Curious means that you got questions. Um, I actually come from teaching in an elementary school. I taught the upper grades, but I love watching, especially the youngest grades, kindergarten. My goodness, kindergartners are curious. They ask so many questions. They wonder so much. It's strange and maybe a little sad that as we get older, we stop doing that all the time. I've got a cute little five-year-old daughter and she starts kindergarten today, actually. In fact, probably right this minute. Um, I'll tell you, she's a curious kid. She asks so many questions. What we saw in the Apple commercial, what we try to shoot for as a school is to be very, very curious. The R on the count of three, what does it stand for? One, two, three. Oh, at least three of you knew it. The R means respectful. Now, that is a powerful thing on a lot of levels. Respectful from, from kid to kid, adult to kid, kid to adult. Um, there is something about, even if you feel like maybe someone else is not being respectful to you, that you're part of the solution and not part of the problem and you treat people with respect. That's when it's hardest. Sometimes I think we're like, well, he wasn't respectful to me, so I don't have to be respectful to him. And I'll tell you, a sign of character is the one who can be respectful, even if they feel they've been slighted, even if they feel they've been disrespected. And that is something that we shoot for in our classes, in our hallways, in our lunchroom, and in every facet of us as a school. The A on the count of three, one, two, three. <laughs> Summer's gotten you rusty, but you're on fire, my friend. I can't, I wanna see if you guys can all be louder than him. That's the whole goal, you can be louder than him. Accountable. Now, this is always important. It gets more important every single year of your life. You get more and more responsibility and fewer and fewer people doing it for you. I just told you about my kindergarten daughter. To be honest, my wife and I do almost everything for her, right? She doesn't have to be accountable for a lot yet. Now, starting kindergarten, she's going to be accountable for a little bit more. First grade, a little bit more. And second grade, a little bit more. We're in junior high school, which is really the threshold of adulthood here. You're going to be getting ready here for high school. And I'll tell you, here and high school, there is a lot of accountability keep on your shoulders. Keeping organized, keeping track of things is what it means to be accountable. All right, we're going to beat him on the Z. Everybody think what it is. One, two, three. Well, you did better, but he still beat you. <laughs> I like this one. It's kind of a weird saying to say zero quitting, but that's what it is. We don't quit. Doesn't mean we don't fail. We fail all the time. We try it. It didn't work. We try again. The quitting is the part we don't ever do. And that's where I have in classrooms. Sometimes I'll come in, I'll work with kids. Say, I don't get it. And I'll try to shove their paper out of their way. That's okay that you don't get it. It's not okay that you push the paper away and stop trying. And that's what we talk about when we say zero quitting or what we're shooting for, for zero quitting. All right, your last chance to beat him because he's got all of them better than the rest of the audience combined. Throw him a bone, maybe go. Ready? The why. One, two, three. You. Uh, maybe you tied him. The why is a reminder that it all starts with you. Um, the bottom line is you, you can't control anybody else but you can control yourself. And if you've got someone who's not being respectful or someone who's not being curious, is there a quitting or accountable? Encourage them, but know that it all starts with you. I'm gonna bring that one up again in just a little bit, uh, minute. Um, I don't wanna spend too much time on this. And my peer leaders are, I've got two of them now. I don't need you guys. I need, I need at least four of you. Five would be better. So if you're one of our peer leaders in Mrs. Longstaff's fifth period class and you're not in this room and you're hearing me, we invite you to come down here in just a moment. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask my first peer leader. Come on, Mr. Biddle, I'm going to need you right here. He didn't know I was going to put him on the spot here. But we're going to talk about what crazy looks like in different areas of the building. So come stand right here, and I'm going to ask you to tell us what it means to be curious in the multipurpose room. Learn and try something new. Appreciate the talents of others. Simple. Thank you. Give me a round of applause, guys. <laughs> 
Learn and try something new. Appreciate the talents of others. And the multi-purpose room is really synonymous with saying, what are our expectations for an assembly? That's what we're looking for. Today, you're going to hear in these first few assemblies a lot from me. But more and more and more, we expect to have other teachers and even better, a lot of students up here presenting and performing. That's where we want to appreciate their talents. We don't want to detract from their talents and let this be a great celebration or a focus for them. You ready? Come on up. She's going to tell us what it means to be respectful. And I'm hoping one of my peer leaders gets here by then. Oh, I think I got another one. When you're ready, tell us what respectful means. Kai Foodi, applaud politely and cheer for others. Use appropriate language and volume. Let's give her a three clap salute. One, two, three. Kai Foodi. Anyone know what Kai Foodi means? And this is one even the seventh graders should be able to tell because they just came from elementary school, which is where they say Kai Foodi a lot. Do you know what it means? Can you shout it out for us? Well said. If you couldn't hear it, I'm going to repeat it. She said, keep your hands, feet, and other objects to yourself. Guys, we've heard that since, since elementary school. It doesn't mean it's any less real now. I'd say it's all the more real now, which is why in this room I've got everybody sitting about six feet apart. <laughs> it's keeping our hands, feet, and other objects to ourselves. Um, I also bring up Kaifudi in a junior high thing that we don't usually say in the elementary school, but that also deals with public displays of affection. Public displays of affection are when we're being overly affectionate or touching of another person. And that is the same rule as Kaifudi. Um, it's so important now, and I, I need to emphasize it because I get it. I've seen people this last week that I hadn't seen for months. And what do I want to do when I first see them? I want to go give them a high five, a handshake, a hug. And in, in many ways, that's the worst thing I could do to them. That's what would harm them if, by chance, we've got the virus being spread. So I want to be careful not to do that. Kai Foodi is so important with those ones. All right, I now have a third. So my peer leaders, you're, you're coming just in time. I'm going to need two more before I get, get any further. Can I borrow you right up here? You didn't know you are going to be put on the spot right when you walked in the room. Come stand right here. One of my third peer leaders. I'm going to have you tell everybody on there what it means to be accountable in the multipurpose room. Accountable means to enter quietly, take care of school property, listen to the presenters, and put away equipment. Nice job. Give him a three-clap salute. One, two, three. Thanks. You can have a seat. Peer leaders, I needed at least two more of you. Hustle, hustle, hustle. Um, yes. When we're doing an assembly, and this goes for a lot of other areas we'll talk about in the future, is we enter as quietly as we can. I usually like when, when we're getting ready for the assembly that you, you can chat a little bit with the people next to you, especially when you give me your attention right when I call for it. This group did both things perfectly, and like I said, I'm not in the other rooms to know how that looks right now. Taking care of school property, listening to the presenter. Listening is not just with your ears. Listening is with your whole body language. You listen with your eyes, you smile, you nod. Those are the things that really, really help presenters. Um, it's true here in an assembly. It's extremely true in your classroom. Your teachers are looking for feedback, and it's harder to get because of the masks, right? Can't see if you're smiling, can't see if you're frowning. So as much as you can, use the rest of that body language to, to showcase it. All right, I didn't get another peer leader here in time. Oh, man. I'm looking at the door like someone magic's going to walk through. They did. Can I have a volunteer who feels comfortable in the audience to do that? Oh, here's one. We got one right in time. <laughs> you're so lucky. Would you do me a favor and come stand right here, and you're going to tell us what it means to be zero quitting. Stay focused on the present presentation. Try, fail, and try again. Beautifully done. Grab a chair over here and have a seat right up here by these guys. That is zero quitting. You stay focused. I know sometimes you're going to hit, whether it's in an assembly, whether it's in class, some moments that just are not as exciting or interesting to you as other moments. I get that. I know it. Um, but the best you can do is to keep focused, try to have things that might distract you kept put away, and that try, fell, and try again like we talked about before. Um, I'm going to ask for you, my friend. Here. <clears throat> That's our main ones for what crazy is in the – auditorium or the multi-purpose room. The last word on there is the why. And I'm going to have you do this for us. You lean in and in your most charming facial expression you can, as close to screen as you can, I want you to say, you. Got it? Let's see what you got. Close, close, close. You. <laughs> You're going to have to do that a few times for me. Bring your chair once you come sit by these guys because I'm going to pull you up here again in a minute. 
That's it, guys. Curious, respectful, accountable, zero quitting you. Let's see how well these five can memorize that. Got it? So when I point at you, I want you to say just the word that I put you in charge. Serious, respectful, accountable, zero quitting, and you. And every time, I want your face right up here. So you're going to have to be close. Hey, bring your chair. Put your chair right there. Because you're going to be close to the screen every time. Let's test them out. Let's see how they do. Go. They didn't do so well. Let's test them out again. Let's see how they do. Go. You. Could you guys hear him? Could you guys hear him? No. People in this room couldn't hear you. You think people all the way across the West Valley could hear you? Mm-hmm. Let's try it again. Go. You. Better? You think they can do better? Come on, guys. West Valley needs to hear you. You think of where the Westlake building is? That's what I want to hear. Okay? That far. We ready? Go. You. You should put the use got it. There you go. In fact, I want to do it again. You pop right up there, and we want to see your face each time. Got it? One more louder than all. That one's pretty good, though. Last one. Go. You. Your timing was terrible. Terrible. I said that was the last one, but he can do better. I think he can do better. You got to be ready, man. All right. Again, again, again. Be ready. You ready? Go. You. Okay. That's a lot better. Give them a three-clap salute. Nice job, guys. Stay here because I'm going to need that lot, okay? Be ready for me all the way through. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to hold on this for a second. Are your devices still working, you guys? Can you pull that out and check for me if they are? Let's see. This is a little bit. Is yours still working? Okay. I'm going to try this, and we've never tried this before. In a second on the screen, you're going to see something else, and this is going to be a little bit of a brain break and a way to make sure that we feel like we're all in the same room, even though we're not all in the same room. Often we'll throw in a game during an assembly because we just need to change the pace every now and then. So we're going to try this. If it doesn't work, sorry, and we'll shut it down and keep going. But let's at least give it a shot. I'm going to switch the screen. This is going to be an opportunity where you have permission for me to take your cell phone out of your yellow bag in your classrooms or in this room. We are going to put them back in after this. But if you have a cell phone, you may pull it out. If you don't have a cell phone, you can still participate by watching on the screen. But it's fun to have a cell phone and get to do this. Let's try it. Can you push uh, everybody in? Yep. Okay. Gotta find the right one. I went through all of them. I missed it. There it is. All right, here's how the game works. If you can do me a favor, everybody who's got a TV, your, or it's not a TV, a, um, a, a cell phone on you, you're going to go to what's called jackbox.tv. So the word is jack, J-A-C-K-B-O-X dot TV. Now you're going to pick for this one, okay? You're picking for me. We have an eighth grader up here who's trying to answer this question. What percentage of people have attended a roller derby match? He's going to guess. If you go to jackbox.tv and just type in the room code EFBK, you're going to vote on whether you think he's right or wrong. Okay? So right or wrong on each of those. Let's see if the eighth grader can pull this off. Come stand up here so everybody knows you're the one participating. All right. The correct answer was... 12%. 12%. You guessed 50, and it was actually 12%. It was 38% lower. So all of the audience members in every part of this room or around the entire school or even out in West Valley, you got to pick on there what you thought that answer was. So let's have my seventh grader come on up here. You get a different question. Her question is, what percentage of people have watched a film in the Air Bud franchise in its entirety. <laughs> Air Bud is a 
movie about a basketball playing dog. So how many people do you think, what percentage have, have done, have seen a movie in the Air Bud franchise? I'm gonna tell you right now, I've never seen one. Has anyone here seen one? Some of you have, are they good? They're pretty good? Now it looks like we've got 107 of you out there participating and you're getting to say higher or lower what you think here. So she says 64%, everybody else is trying to guess, is she right or is it higher than that or lower? What does this group think? Give me a thumbs up if you think it's higher than that. Give me a thumbs down if you think it's lower than that. The answer is it was lower. 28% of people have seen a movie in the Air Bud franchise. I didn't know that, that's really great. All right, you take a seat, you stand up here, you're up next. You ready? Here's the next question. See, right now, let's see who's winning. Seventh or eighth grade? No points yet. Oh, now we're gonna do um, a question about dating. What percentage of people have dated someone who had already dated one of their good friends? Now your eighth grader representative is up here and he's picking. He thinks 25%. All right, audience. What do you think? Is it higher or is it lower? Is that audience right here? You are? That's what I asked. Higher or lower? Oh, oh, that's what it's doing. It's actually surveying who's. <laughs> 45. So there goes our <laughs> thousand points to the seventh grade team on that because you were too far off, man. Too far off. 45%. All right, you're up. Come stand right here so people know that you. I misspoke a little bit. On your phone, you're the ones we're surveying. So when we heard before there was 25% who had seen Air Bud, that's talking about everybody in Westlake. All righty. What percentage of people have flown kites in the past year? What do you think? She's thinking maybe in the 40s. She went 44%. All right. Everybody out there, have you flown a kite in the last year? Looks like we've got 181, 195, 200 people who have told us. That's a lot of people finding out how many of those people have flown a kite in the past year. I haven't. I need to fly a kite again. Let's see if it's 44%. I'm rooting for you, seventh grade. Come on, seventh grade. Oh, it was much lower. Who would have thought? 15%. 15% of our Westlake crowd has flown a kite in the last year. All right, eighth grade, you're up. You're up. You're up. He's representing all our eighth graders. Seventh grade's kind of running away with it right now. No pressure, dude. <laughs> Round one scores. We're going to stop right here. Seventh grade, 1,100. Eighth grade, 550. Give them a round of applause, everybody. Now, what's kind of interesting about that is that is the first grade-wide points in our crazy point scheme that we're going to award. We are now awarding 100 crazy points to the seventh graders. If you're a seventh grader, give yourself a big round of applause. Now, a lot of the seventh graders are going, yay, I just got 100 crazy points. What are crazy points? And we're going to talk about that in a minute. The eighth graders, if they'd won, they knew exactly what crazy points are. All right, moving along. Here is our school. You see a lot of red arrows because those represent what the blue arrows up do, do in the top. The one-way hallways. I have got to hand it to you guys. I have been so impressed. We've never done something like this. This was from guidance from our um, state health department to see if we could mitigate as much as possible um, interactions or bumping into each other or breathing on each other. And walking outside was a recommendation. And walking in one-way hallways was a recommendation. And we thought, well, let's give this a shot. And you have impressed. It's been amazing. I know it's a little weird. Sometimes like, oh, we just need to get to that class right there. And you end up going all the way around a block or all the way outside and back in. I, I know. But you've done so well with it. And I agree with the recommendation. Watching it, I go, yes, this does seem to have way less bumping into each other way less breathing on each other than what we used to see in our hallways. So kudos, congratulations to you. Now, the thing I do want to point out on this 
is that we've got an area I think we can improve upon. It's a little unique how this whole thing is set up, but you see that we've got our building one, which is the building that I'm currently standing in, because I'm in the multi-purpose room here, and we have our building two. Building one is a square with a bunch of arms coming off of it, okay? You got an arm up here, an arm down there, an arm over there. Um, so when we talk about one-way hallways, the square is kind of unique. The square is where we go clockwise, the direction of clockwise. And then all of these other hallways dead end, which means you walk out of the building when you do it. You're great at that part. But when you come back into building one, on your fingers, show me which door you usually come in. When you're coming back into building one, what door do you usually come in? Ms. Gordon over there knows what door. Okay, I'm seeing lots of fingers up. Most in my room, I don't know what it looks like in the other rooms, are holding up three. I agree. This is where I see most of the people coming into building one. Most of you. And it makes sense why. Building two is right over here, right? So it makes a lot of sense that, oh, that's, that's such a fast way in. And you go from building two to building one through doorway number three. Here's the problem, guys. First off, we don't use doorway number one. Doorway number one is for parents to come in and work with the office. So when we're doing passing time, we don't use doorway number one. But here's what doorway number two looked like yesterday morning, right before school started, right? This is right before school. And I don't know who this is, but I was so proud of her. <laughs> right there, the only student who was getting ready to go into doorway number two. Doorway number two, by the way, is right there. If you don't know the building yet, that's where doorway number two is. Let's look at doorway number three. Oh, this is gonna be so exciting. You might even see yourselves. Ready? Doorway number three. Here you see doorway number three. And like we all just noticed on our little pole right here, and we took most of us put three, the number three up on our fingers. It makes sense, but that's where we're all at. You want to see doorway number four? Here's doorway number four. Zero. There's not a single person at doorway number four. Not even one. So I want to go back to, in fact, I'm going to need these guys. Are you ready? You know what to do, right? Go. You. One more time because it makes me so happy. Go. You. You. That's what I want to talk about for this moment. The why. You. We have social distance hallways. We have different doors we want you to come in. We have the one-way hallways. We can put lots of parameters in place, but this is a case where it really does all start with you. I think that you can go through school and keep yourself pretty socially distant as long as you're choosing to do so. Now, when we've got three doors available for you, and you come up to a door, whether it's three or two or four, or whatever happens in the future, if you come up to a door and it's too crowded, you, you, say it, you, you, go to a different door that's less crowded. If I took the crowd at doorway three and I put a third at one, and a, or at two and a third at four, man, that would have helped. And I need you to do that, to choose. To decide, oh, this one's crowded. I got to put myself in a position where I can keep a little bit better socially distant. All right, we're doing great on there. Let's talk about transition times. Very impressive so far. We do this every year, and every year we're learning the first week, and I can't get over how well you guys have done this first week. You take a while before we can really have so impressive. So, passing time is five minutes long. We also, and our eighth graders are remember this a little bit. We have ID badges like the one I just put on the screen. Um, that you're actually going to be getting from your first period teacher on Monday. Looks like this. It's got a big QR code. On the back, it's got a place where you can earn more crazy points like seventh graders just did. But this is something that we use for a little gamification of our attendance. We talked about wanting to get there as quickly as we can. You're doing so great. We also want to reward you for it. And so we actually give you points, crazy points, based on how quickly you can get from one class to the other. Now, the way those points actually work is when you get scanned in by a teacher, it actually gives you credit. It records what time you got there. It says, sweet, this person got here in one minute. If I get there in the first minute, I'm gonna earn 10 crazy points. It goes to my personal account, not just the whole seventh grade, but to my personal account. 
and I got 10 more points for just that one class. If I do it again the next class, I get another 10 points. And it adds up pretty quickly. Um, I didn't tell the seventh graders yet what those crazy points are for. And we're going to go more in detail in a future week. But so you know, we run a Mustang market, a store, where you don't have to use money. You use your points. And we sell snacks in it. We sell hoodies. We sell hats in it. And the points you, you get cash in at that Mustang. If I'm in a two minutes, three points. First three minutes, I get four six points. First four minutes, I get four points. You can see that the longer it takes you, the fewer points you get, right? If I'm last minute, I'm going to be somewhere in the zero to two point range, okay? If I'm over, that means the bell rang and I was in class. Not only did I go down a tardy on my attendance, but I actually just paid 10 points. It's a negative 10 points if you don't make it in those five minutes. Now, from what I've seen, I am feeling like we're going to be paying a lot of points this year because <laughs> you guys were impressive on this. Quick story. Um, Many of you may not know this, but I actually was an elementary school teacher before I got to come to the junior high school. So I was in elementary school in fifth and sixth grade. I um, then became a principal in the elementary schools, and then I came to the junior high schools. When I was studying in college to become an elementary school teacher, I had to take some classes that helped me know the things that elementary teachers get to teach. Now, you've all been in elementary school, right? You know what elementary school is like. And I remember doing the class where they were teaching me how to teach elementary, younger grade, PE. Pretty cool, Mr. Roland, right? We're talking yeah, PE yeah. for you. Uh -huh. Elementary PE. Now, it's hard to remember because it's like 80% of your life ago, but think back when you were in kindergarten, first and second grade. Can you remember your PE class? Some are uh, a little bit, some are like this. You did different things in PE back then than you do now. One of the things you did in PE in elementary school was that you learned how, they usually put the mats out, like the wrestling mats, they didn't wrestle them. They put the mats out and you learned how to tumble. You heard that word before? Or to do a somersault. You remember in school, preschool or kindergarten, ever being taught how to do a somersault? Can I give me a nod? I do so, yes. These guys remember it? Yes, that's something you learn when you're in kindergarten or second grader. So when you're learning to be an elementary teacher, they have to teach you how to tumble as well. So I went to BYU. I'm a U of U fan, by the way. It's a good time to point that out. But I went to BYU, and I was in the elementary education program. And one of my classes was teaching elementary PE. I showed up, and at BYU, any sport program, you have to go to the locker room, boys or girls, and you come in, and they give you a school university issued set of clothing to wear while you work out. You don't get to keep it, you just work out in it, you give it back to them and they wash it for the next person, right? That's how it works at that university. So I did, I had my BYU clothes on, I went in to get this class done. They were teaching us tumbling and they had to have us, the tumble. they had to have us do the somersaults and all those different things. Now I am a big five foot 16 inch guy. It is really hard to do a somersault when you're this tall. But I was a good participant. I was a good sport, and I was doing it. So they had all of us do our somersaults all the way around the room, kind of like you did when you were in elementary school. And then we got back, and the teacher was telling us why she would do that with students. And I remember while I was sitting there that one of my classmates got my attention and said, Hey, Mr. Half, she didn't call me that, but she got my attention. And I said, yes. She pointed at my shoulder and said, you're bleeding. And I looked at my shoulder and my entire shoulder and all the way down my back was soaked in blood. <laughs> the whole thing, I thought she meant I was bleeding a little. It was everywhere. And I went, oh! It was in that moment I remembered that I actually had gotten stitches back there the night before. So the stitches had come out and my wound had started to bleed. I was kind of embarrassed. I told the teacher I had a problem and I had to stand up and walk out of the gym, walk back into the BYU locker room. And when you come in, you know, there's some like football guys in there and the basketball guys and they're all, you know, they're, they're also getting ready for their workout. And I come up from my elementary ed class and I got blood all over me and all of these big tough football players stop and go, whoa. What happened to you? And I said, tumbling. 
I was very proud of it too. You gotta own that, right? Now I tell you that because as you see on the slide, this is a unique time, guys. This is a school in a pandemic. This is not something that you've ever done before, that I've ever done before, that any of us have ever done. This is gonna be a war wound kind of thing. That was my war wound story in my PE class in elementary ed, right? This is a war wound kind of thing that you're gonna be telling your kids, and this is gonna go down in history of what it was like to try to get our world up and running again in a pandemic. And really what is the trailblazer when we get our society going again? are the schools, are the students. You guys lead out. And in the first three and a little bit of days, I congratulate on how you've done with that. Let's talk a few specifics. We can keep each other safe. Now, we talked about our crazy um, acronym. The R stands for? Who's R? Oh, you guys are so good. <laughs> Who's the R? You're the R, say it out. Respectful. The R stands for respectful, and this is a great way that we show respect is to keep each other safe. Here they are. Washing our hands regularly with soap and water for 20 seconds. Now, we are lucky in some ways that we are at a facility that has sinks in a lot of our classrooms. Not every one of our classrooms has hands. We want to do that as often as we possibly can. That's how we're showing respect to each other and keep each other safe. Let's do this one right here. Keep six feet away from others as often as you can. Sometimes it's not possible. But the further away you can get yourself from, from somebody else, it's gonna help us a lot. The lunch line, wow, I have been very impressed, especially the last two days. I keep coming out saying, guys, we've got lots of space, just spread that line out, and you've done a really good job with that. It's not the way we used to do it, so it takes a little getting used to, but you've got your spot line, just spread it out a little bit. As often as you can, give it that sick feet. That's why you'll see in the lunchroom that there's actually those X's on the ground to show about what six feet are. Um, cover your nose and mouth by wearing a mask. Look at the person next to you. Look at the person on the other side of you. Look up in front, look behind you. Every single person with a mask, excellently done. This is probably our biggest dress code requirement of the year, <laughs> which is a little unique. It wasn't something we had before but you've done a perfect job with it and it's about showing respect to one another. This is how we keep each other safe. We're gonna talk about those again in a little second here. The other one is this, stay home when you're feeling sick. Now, sometimes you're troopers, and you're like, I don't wanna miss any days, I wanna make sure I'm there. Um, we've got a pretty good option for you this year that when you're sick, it'll be like you could be here, but we need to be very careful. So when you're sick um, and have those symptoms, and I actually have a little, form that I've given to your parents so they can check you every morning to see if you have any of those symptoms, you gotta stay home. Let's talk about the masks for another moment. Some of you have seen this, I told you before, the video audio doesn't work great for transmitting it, it works great for screen. So do the best you can to listen in the classrooms. <clears throat> We're gonna listen to Bill Nye for a second. I love Bill Nye, he's the science guy. Greetings everyone, Bill Nye. Why do people in the scientific community want you to wear a face mask when you're out of public? Well, please consider the following. <laughs> face masks like this one prevent particles from my respiratory system from getting into the air and then into your respiratory system. Blocking the movement of air is an old trick. Here's the scarf. It blocks the movement of air around my throat. Helps keep me warm. This scarf won awards at the Washington State Fair for both design and workmanship. They can block the movement of hair, but only to a certain extent. This is a homemade face mask. It has just two layers of cloth with a pipe cleaner sewn in now to fit against the bridge of your nose. It then blocks the movement of air very effectively. If you're wearing one of these, you're protecting yourself and those around you. Here's an N95. These are made to block particles in the medical environment and when you're out mowing the lawn. This one's not sterilized, but it's pretty effective. So the reason we want you to wear a mask is to protect you, sure. But the main reason we want you to wear a mask is to protect me from you and the particles from your respiratory system from getting into my respiratory system. Everybody, this is a matter of little. 
of life and death. And when I use the word literally, I mean literally a matter of life and death. So when you're out in public, please wear a mask. Thank you for joining me on Consider the Follow. I like that, Bill Nye. He's a, he says it well. Um, and I also like that demonstration. It shows you how, how well it does keep um, particles from our lung system, our respiratory system, from actually getting out. You couldn't even blow that candle out. So it's kind of interesting to see that. All right, behind me on the screen, you can see we're going to talk briefly about distance learning. A lot of the kids in the room or in this building might be thinking, why are we talking about that? We're the students who chose to be in person learning. And this is important for all of us to be aware of. This is a unique year. Now, I already talked about you might need to stay home when you're sick, and that's a decision that you and your parents make based on symptoms. There might be situations that we are directed um, by our Department of Health to quarantine. Um, it might be the case that you were in, in close proximity to someone who tested positive for the, co the coronavirus, and they say, hey, we need you to stay away from other people for 14 days. And you'll, you'll be like, but I was one who was going to do in-person learning, and the answer is going to be not for the next 14 days or not. That could happen for a person, it could happen for a class, it could happen for a school, it could happen for a school district, it could happen for the whole state. We don't know. All of you know what happened last year. It was amazing. We had the happiest day of the year, and then that night the governor said, let's shut it all down. And I understand why, but we all of a sudden went from a Friday afternoon thinking we were gonna see you guys on Monday, to we didn't get to see you hardly at all the rest of the year. So we just don't know when or how that's gonna happen. We need to be ready with distance learning for everybody. So let me talk briefly about some things to be aware of with distance learning. They are these. First off, have a device that you can use at home. Now, especially to start, we think we're going to have the inventory to get it so everybody who needs a device, whether at-home learners or in-person learners, can have one. But if you know you've got a device at home that's great, a family computer, and you're like, oh, I can get on my Google Classroom just fine from that, I'd say start with them. If you don't, then we can help you out. Now, I am talking to those who are already at home. They've been checking them out since last Friday night at the open house and all through the week. Some of you have been checking them out because you know that, oh yes, I know I'm in person learning, but I still need a device at home. To do this, we need a parent to come and pick it up because when we hand a Chromebook out that costs $200, we like the parent to realize that they're in charge of a Chromebook that costs $200. Um, sometimes when we just hand it out to the kids and the parents aren't aware, that can be a little bit of an awkward conversation later. So yes, we do like to have the parents come and pick them up. We have um, carts that we've been checking out throughout the day. Um, I've had a wonderful crew right up here on the front door. The first day was a little hard as we were getting all the other things ready for the school. But the rest of the week, we've, we've been giving out Chromebooks for parents who come and check them out. Tomorrow is a distance learning day for everybody, including everybody in the building. So tomorrow, we will still be outside um, for parents who wanna come and pick up a Chromebook. Like I said a second ago, if you've got a device at home that works, Use that for now until we get our legs under us with the inventory. The next thing says, watch for the weekly email of instructions from your teachers. Raise your hand high if you got that email this week. Let me say it again because I've got some who I think didn't hear what I was asking for. Raise your hand high if you got an email with some instructions from your teachers. That It actually came from me, but inside the email were lots of different instructions. You guys did? If you didn't, you need to check your Gmail on your Chromebook. Okay, at the very bottom, there's a little thing that's got your email. If it didn't come to you for some reason, you need to shoot me an email and say, Mr. Howe, I didn't get it, what's up? I'll check the email, I can even check the exact time it went to you, and we'll get it fixed. You will get something like that every single week. Um, your parents will be copied on it as well. It's a great little message, you know, Mrs. Horton who's standing right here, she'll have explained both to her in-person kids and her at-home kids saying, hey, this is what you need to be aware of. It's not the only thing you'll get. There's other things that'll be on a Google Classroom or on a Canvas page, but it's a really good one for you to get a, in one paragraph, a summary of what to expect. The next one says, email your teachers for any questions and be patient waiting for an answer. This is really hard for the school systems to learn how to do quickly. We think we can do it. We can run basically two different schools at once, the in-person school and the online school. It's really hard to get up and running. So if you send an email at nine o'clock in the morning and your teacher hasn't answered you in the next couple of hours, be patient. Your teacher is teaching kids who are right in front of them. You need to be patient and wait a little bit. 
You can also find our email addresses right on our website under the directory. Next one says, check gradebook consistently to see what you're missing. You don't want to get to the end of a quarter and go, oh, I didn't know I was supposed to turn that in. Keep checking your gradebook. Now, this is the one I'm most excited to talk about right now because it's going to start on Monday. And it's very similar to what we're doing right now with this assembly. I've got maybe 30 kids in my room in front of me from two different classes. And everybody else who is watching this, um, everybody else who's watching this is watching it out in the classroom. So it looks like 80 different um, users are on. Now about uh, 35 of those are our classrooms out there. And then it sounds like another 50 at homes across uh, the neighborhood, right? This is going out live and everybody's seeing it. The same thing is going to start to be true with the live classes starting this next week. What it will look like is this. Every one of you has a GraniteSD.org account. That's a Google account, which means you have a kind of tight-knit network of all of the Google offers that's just enclosed inside Granite. doesn't mean that anybody outside of Granite can access it. And on there, your teachers are going to start to just grab a laptop like I did here. They're going to put it on something that can point up at the front of the room. Now, really, that's all that's been sh showing up here. The, the broadcast hasn't shown the class. It hasn't shown everybody else. It's shown me in the screen. And it's just a stream of what's going on in the class. Now, a couple of things to be aware of this. They're not going to record every bit of it because every bit of a 70-minute class can feel a little bit dry when you watch it later, especially when a teacher says, all right, now all of you work on this with groups. And for the next 20 or 30 minutes, you're working independently. That's a boring thing to record. So teachers are probably going to stop recording each time it's not going to be interesting for the people at home. But the live feed will still be there. And usually it'll just be pointing at the screen like this is and showing what the assignment is. So if you're at home, even if you logged on a little late and didn't hear what the teacher said at the beginning of class, whenever you get on, you're probably going to be able to see on the screen like, oh, it looks like we're supposed to write a paragraph about George Washington. Um, you, you're going to know what the class is doing by being able to see it this way. This is optional. You do not have to, when you're a distance learner, be online the whole time the live class is, but it's a good option. If you're wanting to get routine going at home and still know that I can't be at school because of the social distancing, but I want to have that routine at school, this can help you. Now, what is on the screen are what the Google Meet nicknames are. This is on our webpage in case you forgot it, but it's so easy. It's WL, say that with me, WL, one more time. WL, which stands for Westlake, and then your teacher's last name. So I got WL Horton. I got WL Roland. Okay? That is how you go on your Google Meet. You click on the Google Meet and you type in WL Horton, Roland, Cole, any one of them. Okay? And that'll help you through these. All right. We're going to do a quick, quick, quick handbook minute. We do talk about some expectations in these meetings. And instead of doing a whole assembly on it, I'm just going to try to do it in a minute or two each time. We're only hitting two things really fast today. The first one, we are hitting about cell phones. You saw in Mustang Media, I explained cell phones pretty well. I'm going to explain it again for a quick moment. We actually give quite a bit of latitude with the cell phones. We do expect the cell phones to be tied to your driver's license. I call your ID badge your driver's license. So we do not um, allow you having cell phones out if you're not willing to have your ID badge out. That's the way we sh you show, yes, I've, I'm, I'm supposed to be here, I'm authorized, and, and I, I can have my cell phone out. Within the school, cell phones should be used responsibly and not disrupt the learning environment. Students may use their phones during passing period and at lunchtime. Can you use it during class time, guys? No. Can you use it during class time? You're not supposed to use it during class time. Now, there's sometimes an exception where a teacher invites you to do so and says, pull it out. I want you to take a picture of this science experiment. At a teacher's direction, that's different. That's what it says down here. Students may, may use headphones only during lunchtime. So you can have the cell phone out during passing time and answer a text or two, but you shouldn't have your headphones out between first and second period, okay? That's a lunchtime thing or before and after school. Um, during class time, cell phones and headphones must be kept in the classroom cell phone pouch. How many of you saw the cell phone pouches? No one? You already saw Mustang Media Y, right? Um, that is our plan, that is our procedure. It does not work right now with the coronavirus. So we've made the exception that instead of the pouch, put it in your yellow bag. It shouldn't be on your person. Okay, it needs to be in those spots. Now, I'm going to jump all the way down here to the bottom. The first time you're in violation of this and you lose your cell phone, it goes to the office and we'll let you pick it up at the end of the day. The second time, it's like, what? 
You already learned this lesson. The second time, that means it goes to the office and we'll need to talk to your parent before we give it back to you and it can go home. The third time, hopefully never, ever, ever, ever happens. But on the third one, unfortunately, your parent's going to need to come and meet with us and pick up the phone. And there won't, I mean, that, that's what you need to plan on. So I'd say learn this lesson even before the first time, but definitely before the third. All right, I'm already too far in my handbook minute, but I got one more quickly I got to do. Dress code. Let's talk about just bottoms and tops really quickly. Pants, shorts, overalls, and skirts need to ride at the natural waist. I better get my natural waist. There we go. At the natural waist. This is my waist. That's where your belt should go, right? Um, so that the underclothing, all your underwear, isn't shown, okay? So you got to have it at the natural waist. Skirts, dresses, and shorts should cover at minimum half of the thigh. Now, if you're sitting here wondering what the thigh is, let me explain it. Here's where my waist is, where my belt goes. Here's my knee. The thigh is the thing in between. So you got to have things cover up halfway between that, those regions, okay? Here's my belt. Here's my knee. I better have shorts or skirt or whatever at least halfway down. Got it? Pants with large slits, tears, or see-through panels over the same exposed area of the thigh are restricted. So you might be like, no, i got pants that go all the way to my ankle, but if you've got holes that are showing all this part that you're not supposed to show, that means it doesn't work. And you'll get a dress code pair of pants or have to have a parent come and change you out. So that's what that part means there. The tops. All tops must have sleeves that cover the shoulder completely. So if you've got sleeves that don't cover the whole shoulder, that's not going to work with the dress code. Tops may not be, have sheer or see-through panels. So sometimes it covers it, but it's all see-through, right? If it's see-through, it's the same thing as not having a sleeve. No tank tops or spaghetti straps are permitted unless worn with a t-shirt on top of it that meets the dress code. So yes, you can have spaghetti straps or a tank top as long as there's a jacket or something that completely covers that. The problem is if you're putting that on and not putting the jacket on, it's still a dress code violation. And this is true, by the way, guys, to and from school on the school bus. That's part of school. Now, when you get home and you've got your um, routine at home, that's going to be between you and your parents. But at school, that's the expectation we need. Um, the style of clothing must be modest enough to cover all underwear, bra straps, and cleavage. The length of the tops should be long enough to tuck in and or cover the waistline of the pants or skirt. No bare stomachs. Even when the arms are raised above the head. That's when it gets tricky, guys. So if you have a shirt that just barely gets down to your belt line, but every time you move a little bit, it shows your whole stomach. It doesn't work for school, guys. It's kind of like this video. I always think this is funny. You're not going to hear it really well, but it just got a scream in it. Put your hands up. <laughs> That's a Lego animation that Granite Park Junior High put together a few years back, where the Lego guy puts his hands up or her hands up, and then the second she does, it shows the waistline or the waist coming out. You've got to, you got to try that at home when you put your outfit on. Like it, every time I move, am I showing, showing things I'm not supposed to? Yeah, that means it's not long enough. We're almost done, guys. The last thing we got to talk about today in the last few seconds we've got our fire alarm procedures. We do a grand total. Thank you. They told me where I'm going. <laughs> We're going to end our meeting with a fire alarm procedure and a fire alarm. We do exactly one announced fire drill a year. By law, all of our fire alarms are unannounced. I say this for students. I say this for teachers. They have to be unannounced. It's the law. We are allowed to announce one of them, and it's today's. And the reason we can announce one of them is because then we can teach and learn together. Now, we're really going to need to learn together today because we've never done a fire drill on this property yet. Um, you're going to see on the screen right behind me. Uh, let me just say these briefly. When we have a fire alarm go, students are going to make a silent orderly exit. Okay. Um, you're going to make sure the classroom doors are closed and lights are turned off. Teachers have a list. They count for all their students. Teachers hold up the appropriate red or green indicator. Once they've assessed their class role, green means I've got everybody. Red means I've got a problem. Students and teachers return to their class when they've received the all clear signal. Okay. So that's kind of the procedure for the fire alarm. But let's look at what Mr. Roland just handed me. These are our maps of our evacuation plan. You may have seen some of these in your, your teacher's classrooms. Um, it depends where you're at when the fire alarm goes. If you're coming from elementary school, it was so easy. You were almost always in the same room. In junior high and high school, you're always in a different room. So it's hard to plan. You don't know what room you're going to be in when the fire alarm goes off. If you're in any of these rooms, Roland, Reaver, Gonzalez, Longstaff and Walker, Baker or Watts, 
you're actually going to head right over here to the, um, that's kind of the north side of our property, northeast side of the property. You can kind of see where that is in relation to the school. Your teacher will take you out the right door because they understand how the door flow works. Now, if you're in any of these rooms down here, I've got Armitrow, Fake, uh, Barker, Schaefer, Rich, Stubbs, Steenblood, Bora, Coons, Hay, Telford, Eaton, Reynolds, Munsell, Linebacker, Bowman. They're all going to the south side. And again, the teachers will know which door to walk you out of, but that's where you're supposed to go line up with your class. Finally, over here on more of our west side, kind of southwest side, you're going to see that we have up here Rebellions, then Martin, Reeser, Mack, Christensen, Rundich, Rados, Lomo, Todd, Osmond, Parkin, Moore, Reynolds, Cole, Elander, the Matthew, Mason, Paul, Clayton, Pedersen, Morton, Huntington. Big group out there on the side. You're going to line up on that side and follow carefully your teacher's directions in each of these. Now, one thing I'm going to say different this year for a drill right now, um, this is a drill, and for today's only, we, we know this one's a drill because this one's announced. I'm telling you it's a drill. This isn't real. But in the future, when it's unannounced, you never know. Maybe it went off because there really was a problem. Maybe there was an electrical thing in the kitchen. Um, but for today's only, I am asking the teachers to maybe not go as quick so they can avoid the congestion. Teachers, if you get to the hallway – and it is a mass of people. Don't go into the hallway yet. Wait till the crowd thins a little bit. We're, we're going to bite off a little bit of a slower evacuation time just so we can maximize social distancing. After today, we need to just assume that it's real. So we need to move out as quickly as we can always. Is that clear? All righty. Now we're going to end our live stream here um, in just a moment. But you get to see the fun end of how a fire drill starts. Um, when we're ready, we always get out the timer. So I better get that out. And we also call Mr. Goble. Problem is, Mrs. Wall and Mrs. Uh, Luther are talking on the radio. <laughs> They're having a very long conversation. Wait just a moment. This really builds the anticipation. Hey guys, can I override you for a second? Mr. Goble, do you copy? Go ahead. We are ready for the fire alarm. Are you ready to do it? I am. I'm standing right next to it, so I can just go for it if you like. We would like. Are we ready, guys? Yeah. Cover your ears. They all say they're ready. Let's go for it. And to our audience on our YouTube stream, see you later. Yeah. Oh, it's so exciting. Here it comes. Here it comes. Just calling it in before we pull it. I can't find the clock to time us. Where's the clock? Here it is. Stopwatch. There we go. Officer Robert. Go ahead. Could you help me find a minute by going through the last